All statements and opinions expressed by guests of this podcast are not representative of the Ortho Chat, its host, or its producers, and should not be associated with the podcast unless explicitly stated by the host. You are listening to the Ortho Chat by Yanni Katsadas. <laughs> Brothers and sisters in Christ, welcome back to the Ortho Chat. This is episode 14. We are here with Father Njegos. Father, how are you? Doing well. How about I'm doing okay. Um, what's new? What's uh, what's going on? Oh, not much. Just a uh, busy, 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 busy season for our church. I'm here at St. Elijah's in Aliquippa, Pennsylvania. The new priest here. I'm the actually the the temporary administrator here at this parish. And we just had our bishop, his grace, your name, visit us. For this weekend so it was a very busy weekend and very exhausting in many ways but also a huge blessing for us and for our parish oh i understand it's um it's always it's always an adjustment period getting used to a new flock and a new family but you know i i came uh for the reception ceremony of yours and all the people were very nice and it seems like things are going to be going well for the foreseeable future. Uh, would you like to get us started with a prayer or? Yes. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. O Heavenly God, the Spirit of truth, who art everywhere and fillest all things, treasure of blessings and giver of life, come abide in us and cleanse us from every impurity and save our souls, O good one. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now and never and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Um, so kind of starting back at the beginning, I'm assuming you grew up in Serbia, correct? Uh, not correct. I, not uh, correct. No, I was born in Bosnia. Bosnia, okay. Bosnia. So tell us a little bit about your youth and what instilled within you an attraction towards serving God. Well, as I said, I was born in, in, in Serbia in 93, in the midst of a civil war. And in 98, my family emigrated into Canada. Um, and I grew up in Canada. That's where uh, I was five years old when we came and I spent the next 10 years in Canada, growing up through the elementary school system. And uh, basically, uh, our church in, in, in the diaspora, and it's probably for the same for everyone else, is... is a, place a meeting of gathering for traditional practices of folklore dancing and uh and a place of worshiping god and we spent a lot of time at church so uh, at um growing up just at the services um looking at the priest and seeing what he's doing and and especially the great entrance i can see right now in front of my eyes father milovan would come out for the great entrance carrying the gifts and I can hear his voice in my ears right now um, and I imagine myself as a child I was probably 10 years old at the at the time imagining myself being a priest and, and serving God now at that time being 10 years old I didn't know much of what that meant and then uh, I just saw what I saw and I liked that it looked very very in a sense very spiritual he looked like a spiritual leader in my eyes and someone who was very very respected an older priest at that time 
very respected among the faithful there. And it was just, uh, it led me to have that, that, that will to be a priest. Later on, as, as time went by, as I got a little older, um, I started moving a little away from that idea because making that idea a, a realistic was uh, a little hard at the time. I didn't know where to go to seminary high school, or I didn't even know that seminary high schools exist, um, or where to study theology, until Father Radmi Logardovic, he, uh, he was a, a family friend, he came over one day and, and asked me, you know, Saturdays we had Serbian school, and the priests would come and talk to us about the gospel and the Bible stories, and um, and he saw that that really interested me. And what really interested me was the Serbian Orthodox Church and the history and, and the serving people. So he asked me, he said, uh, I see that you're very interested in that and you would be a very good priest. I was only 14 at the time. He said, maybe you should think about it. And if you're interested, we can get a blessing from his grace, Bishop Georgi in Canada. And you should go to him, seminary high school. You will have a, you will have a nice life. You will finish theology, become a priest. And for the next two weeks, I did not sleep much. I thought of it every day. And we got a blessing from our bishop. And that's how it all started. Went to seminary high school. That's beautiful. Now, seminary and high schools are, are very popular out of the country, um, out of America at least. And there's a very uh, there's a very famous one in Botmos that um, if I was young enough, when I found out about it, I would have gone. But uh, that wasn't the case. Now, tell us a little bit about the seminary and high school. What was it? What was it like there? Well, seminary high school, um, it's it's different for everybody because it depends on where you come from. Now, I came from Canada to a small city called Foča near Sarajevo in Bosnia. And that's like going from the 21st century back into, let's say, 18th, 19th century. And the sense of school and, and the school system. And uh, it was very hard to adapt, especially being in Canada. And I was able to, I played basketball rep uh, in the rep league uh, played volleyball in, in high school, basketball, track and field, soccer. Um, so I enjoyed all the sports, enjoyed my friends, enjoyed just living life as a young person at age 14, 15. So I finished my uh, freshman year, or as we say in Canada, grade nine in, in uh, high school. And I had uh, big ambitions to come back and, and you know, go to the gym more, be a better basketball player. And then, and then Father Radmilo came and asked that question. And uh, changed. I, when I got to seminary high school, it's a whole different dynamic, whole different life. It's not about yourself anymore. It's about submitting to, to, to God in a sense of, of respecting your professors, respecting your, your neighbors, and respecting your elders. And it's a whole system. It could be compared to being in, in, uh, in the army. It's that, that system from the morning to night you are, this is more academic than army uh, is, but in a sense, in the morning you wake up early. We used to wake up at 5.45. Church would be at 6 a.m. And then we would have breakfast classes lunch and then after that we would have an hour or two of, of just a resting time and then study periods that would go from four to six and then seven to eight forty five and then at nine thirty in the evening lights out and uh, that was five years so uh, the first three years were very challenging academically but then the last two years fourth and fifth year where I was already 19 and 20 years old it was more of challenging in the sense my peers are home living life 
you know, going out with their friends, having drinks and this and that, enjoying life in a sense. And I'm have to be in bed at 930. So it's a lot of sacrifice. It is a, a lot of sacrifice in the sense that you give those best years from 15 to 20. But it's where you build the firm foundation of theology. It's where you build that that strength when you come to a parish you can't be shaken uh in any sense because you built the good habits and you also built that relationship that you had to build in in that in a school of that type of system so it's it's a it's a great way of you know teaching you for future things that are going to come in life especially you consider, you know, your parents send you money and you need to, you know, be financially uh, wise, especially at a young age, where are you going to spend? And then, you know, making your bed, washing your own uh, socks and clothes. Some of those things were, you know, my friends at the time didn't have to do. We had to do that. And it teaches you a great lesson to, you know, later on, you can lean on yourself uh, in life and not be afraid after seven year high school they can they can send me to china or wherever they want and, and i'll i'll be on my feet and that's that's really what the point of that school was right so just to clarify you went through the seminary high school and then was there more formal seminary training after that as in a bachelor's degree and a master's degree or were you pretty much done after that um after that high school experience so after the high school experience where I have to say uh, I did come from Canada and, and it was seminary high school, theological high school is one of the hardest schools they have in Serbia and Bosnia. And uh, coming from Canada, it was difficult for me to, to get used to the oral exams and, and uh, just that s school system there. But I was able throughout the five years to to be one of the top students there. And that all shows you that with will, with good willpower and with the strength that you get from God, I would study day and night to 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 you know fix up some of my grades and and, and also I had a reward at the time where my bishop, if uh it was out of the 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 grades were out of five, so five was basically like a four point oh. Uh, or a, a plus in, in Canada. Um, and if I did pass with a five, I would get a scholarship for school. So that was added motivation for me. And all the whole five years, I was, I was, a, uh, I had a five in, in average uh, for the school. So it was, it, that was a great motivation, but that just showed all the other students who came from those regions that it's possible. You just need to put in a lot of work and uh, dedicate yourself to the school and into the knowledge because you're there for that you're nothing else so and after that i went to uh saint saba school of theology in chicago libertyville completed four years of undergrad there and uh after that i uh i took a rest of two years in chicago i worked uh at the monastery as a student i made candles after that i worked for the monastery hall and uh, I just needed some time off because it was just a lot of school in one period of time. And I took those two years off and it taught me a lot about myself. It, it taught me that I cannot wait to be back in a classroom. And uh, then in uh, 2019, I uh, applied to St. Vlad's for my master's degree and, and uh, completed that in 2021 with a little bit of COVID, um, how do we say it? Um, adjustment, I adjustment guess. Adjustment here yeah. and there, yes. But uh, we were able to complete it in 2021. And shortly after that, I met my uh, Popadia Sara, my future wife, and uh, we got married in August. So God works in wondrous ways doesn't he and sometimes he takes a while and then when you when you think it's going to last forever it just it rushes it out of nowhere that's it's yes. funny how that works so and that's one 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 thing that i i tell a lot of the students 
uh, that are basically walking in the same footsteps as I did is just not to not to force anything and not to go too quick in life because for us it is difficult you have to meet somebody to become a priest and to finish that complete that final exam which is the hardest exam because it's not easy to be a presbytera or a popadia at all um so one thing i would just suggest is and my professor in seminary high school said this and he said he laughed the first time he heard it and i did as well but you have to pray to god to grant you a woman who is right for that life for that 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 way of life because it's not it's not easy that woman has to love church as much as she loves you because it's a huge sacrifice huge sacrifice it's not just the priest who's a priest and that's it it's a whole family who's a priest and it's a sacrifice that you know it takes understanding especially trying to balance out parish life and family life being a priest and being a husband being a father so it's it's uh i would tell them to just pray to god and give it time the right things come at the right time and god always knows when to hand you what and if it's not right then uh you will see things won't happen they will stagnate and and uh better to act sooner than later of course yeah i i always think that um something christians should instill within themselves is the bravery to let go meaning um sometimes we decide to try to force reality on on ourselves and our lives but most of the time, actually all the time, the best answer is usually to give your stress and your anxieties and your problems over to God and let him take care of the details. And after that, everything's everything ends up all right for the most part. I've noticed that's usually the case. So It is, it is. But uh, you know how human nature is. We are uh, sometimes, we're just, we like comfort. And when we get used to, for instance, I was in a longer relationship for seven years and you get you get so used to uh, that relationship, that person, and you don't realize that things are going astray or it's not meant to be, and you keep pushing and saying it's going to be better. It's better to act sooner than wait longer. Um, and then other people would say it's better that it happened now than later on if you were to get married and you bump into some more serious problems. But um, it's it's uh, we just have to act logically in 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 those moments and submit ourselves to god's will and god will show he'll send you a person who you know makes life so much easier with uh you know it's effortless in in some things that you would never never have thought so thank god it's it's god works in wondrous ways glory be to god yeah. and um you know going back a little bit I wanted I want to hear a little more about your time at the monastery when you were on that break. Did you meet any particularly saintly people or see any miraculous experiences while you were working there or Well, at the monastery and and this is I think a problem um for almost all monasteries, orthodox monasteries in America is, is it's hard to uh get monks and and have them stay. Um, and and even if you do have them, there's not many of them. Um, but at the monastery of Nubirachanitsa and St. Sava Monastery in Libertyville, we have two monks at the time. We had more, but the two that actually stand out were Father Seraphim, and there was another Father Seraphim, Father Seraphim Baltic, and the other one that was at St. Uh, Sava's in Libertyville. And... Um, they're two very different types of monks, but both of them were very, very spiritual. And in the sense that they looked at everybody and all of the students at the time equally, especially Father Seraphim Baltic. He was our student dean. And in a school where, you know, we're all going to be future priests, we all like to, you know, create relationships and, and be close to to. To people and but he would never allow any any of us to 
better with him than the other one. And he would treat us all the same. But on the other hand, he knew all of us and knew how where our heart is and our thoughts and where we are in, in uh, our relationship with God, which is very important because being a student dean there, um, it's not easy. There's all different types of students that come from different types, different places in Serbia and Bosnia, Canada, America. Uh, so it was it was a probably a challenge for him. But when I look at the way he uh, acted towards us, is a great example for how I should act towards my parishioners. Be equal to everybody, and they're all equal in my eyes. Um, without any, you know, causing any uh, or showing any differences, which thank God. And then, uh, you know, just services, services at that Nugratramsa monastery were very, very um, often. And they did, we did the whole services without, you know, cutting anything short or, so you get that whole feel of a monastery um, and, the spiritual side as well, confession, another thing with the monks, uh, you know, you had to be very careful what you do, because whatever you do, you have to confess, and you have to confess that to a monk who basically lives outside of this world, but you are a regular human who sins, and, and so it, it made you think twice before you would, uh, you know, do any sin or or thought or deed however it is so it was it was and i'm grateful for that and those relationships still are um, are maintained to this day and thank god it's 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 a blessing yeah i think that a healthy fear and respect for a spiritual father that's instilled within monasteries is becoming more common and it should become more common amongst regular lay people not out of uh not out of an elevation of, of the pride of, of the confessing father, but more so that people have another reason since, you know, some people need a whole bunch of them to, to not fall into sin. So. Yes. And uh, as one of our professors told us uh, seminary high school, that every priest and every regular person should have a monk within themselves. And that just means that everyone should have their, own prayer practice their own their own routines their own relationship with god in a sense where we do live in busy lives but we all should resemble that and not stay quiet about that it's not something that we should keep only for ourselves but we should talk to our peers talk to our parishioners talk to our parents our family in a sense we're missionaries. Everyone is a missionary. And we should talk about that. And people will I have friends that grew up with me in Canada. And, and you know, just all of a sudden, they, they want to go to church. They're interested about the faith. They want to fast and, and be a part of the church. You know, they come to church after the service. They, they, they feel like they're lighter. They feel better. And they didn't even take communion. So I told them, imagine if you fasted. You took confession, then communion. You know, imagine how you would feel then. So, and it's a sacrifice in today's modern world where we live 300 miles an hour. But we, sh we have to devote our time and ourselves to God, at least that one day in the week. Absolutely. And you have a very unique perspective because all of your formal education was done through an orthodox context going to a seminary high school and then uh, doing a bachelor's degree you said you went to saint sava's for your bachelor's degree correct yeah yeah so you had an orthodox bachelor's program you spent a two-year break in a monastery and then you went to saint vladimir's which is obviously orthodox so you know may it, it offers something unique about the way your development was and I, I think that's really special so and that's one thing that I, I really wanted to, to to sustain is being part of a church in a church setting and not going outside of that um, 
because it's hard for, like I mentioned, us theologians who are future priests, um, it can be difficult when you cannot find someone to get married to or, or you don't find your path and then all of a sudden you're out in the world working something else that has nothing to do with church. And I tried whatever I could do in my will just to stay within the church. And because I, I knew I, I knew what my final mission was and that was to become a priest. Now, I have a lot of friends who completed St. Sava's and now, you know, they have nothing to do with the church or they come on Sundays, but they live in a different, different setting of life. And uh, I was afraid of that because uh, it, it, it does take a little bit. Um, being a part of a church life in a church setting, it's not easy. It's a sacrifice within itself, but it's also rewarding. And then if you, if you're on, on the, on that path, it's uh, better to stay on that path. It will be harder to come back later if you left. And now it's hard to come back. Yeah, I know what you mean. And, you know, after all that, you're finally a priest. Thank God you uh, yes. you made it to the, you made it to one of the many finish lines that uh, life, life has in store for us. And you're fresh. You're fresh out of the, uh, out of the frying pan, so to speak. You've yes. only been ordained since end of last year. Am I correct? In the late part of last year? Well, yes, October 14th and 15th uh, was when I was ordained. And as his grace, our Bishop Pierney says, uh, we went to a dinner on that Monday after that weekend of my ordination. He says, when he would try, uh, when he would uh, introduce me to people, he would say, this is my baby priest. <laughs> so still a baby priest. Yes, October 15th was when I was ordained. Um, it was actually day by day after day. Uh, to the Holy Diaconate on the 14th and that was a protection of the Holy Mother of God uh, on the feast day uh, in Cleveland and then at New Marcha Monastery the next day to that's beautiful so now that you're finally here um, as a new priest what are parts of what you do that you love the most and has any part of it been uh, surprising to you because you've been looking forward to this all your life but and I'm sure you've anticipated a lot of what comes with the work but was there anything that threw you for a curveball so to speak well to answer the first part of your question um, I just uh, I'm very blessed and thank god it's it's uh, I catch myself serving memorial services or, or baptisms or in the middle of, of a holy liturgy and I'm just thinking to myself, what a blessing this is. This is something I worked toward more than half of my life since I was 15 years old. I'm 31 now. And just catch myself thinking, what an amazing, amazing uh, service this is to serve God. And even the other day in, in, in a hospital visit, you know, you're there saying prayers with the daughter of the, of the sick woman. And what, where else would I want to be? Uh, other than there and praying and then th this is what I this is what I studied to be this is what I dreamed about being as a 10 year old child looking at father Milovan and and it, it's I think of it and it's just a blessing um I'm glory to God that I'm in this position and God willing that God gives us strength good health and prosperity that we can do this in the many many years to come but some of the curveballs uh, that uh, that come with priesthood also is is uh, in schools we don't we don't talk much about you know the relationship between a priest and, and the parishioners and specifically uh, you know the parish life with all you know there's a lot of difficulties in every, every in everybody's everyday life and and um, the parish that I'm at here is very large it's living parish so you know every day you get text messages phone calls father what do you think about this father i need to talk to you about that and um, ultimately all of this leads to confession and now when i look back all the knowledge that i attained through my school and especially in seminary high school where i said that the firm foundation was laid um now i can go back to the, all that knowledge since i'm not that experienced 
I can only use my knowledge now. Um, I mean, I, am, I have 30 years, I'm 31 years old. I have some experience in some situations, but there's, you know, always no two situations are the same. Every situation is u- unique. Um, but I use my knowledge and I use my way of looking at the faith and what I read from the Holy Fathers and what I hear, what I hear from the older priests. Um, and I use that to talk to the people. And, and, you know, I always tell all my parishioners at confession, um, orthodoxy is not a hundred meter sprint. It's a marathon. And some of the sins and some of the hardships that we have did not build up overnight. And now overnight they're going to be gone. This is took time to build up and now it will take time to change those old habits and, and, and those issues. And uh, so, and I tell them I'm here and I will be here and I will be here going through those uh, hardships with you. And, you know, don't be afraid. We'll go together with this. We'll fast together. We're here for confession together and we'll take communion together. And God willing, things will change. It will take time. So that was one of the learning, uh, learning, let's say. uh, Learning curves curves yes that that uh in the sense that you know you're you're there now and you're actually put in the position to 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 talk to people talk to your parishioners parishioners who have hardships and glory be to god it's it's uh i try to do my best and uh, you know as much as my knowledge allows me to and and uh we'll see i hope the results will be positive and uh be very, very, uh, you know, good for for uh, God and you know God pleasing deeds. So God willing. Yeah. Well, you've been doing all right up to this point, so you know there's no reason that uh, it won't continue to to go splendidly, God willingly. But God willing. um, have you seen um, getting to know all these people and being a shepherd of this new flock helping your own spiritual life as well? Yes. Yes. And and. Um, it's amazing how you know when, uh, especially when you're when I write my sermons for for gospels, um, just searching for information and not just not just basic information to 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 uh, summarize the gospel, but you know every gospel has that story that's in the background. What is actually trying to be portrayed, and uh, I I uh, use Father Paul Tarazi a lot um, and. It's it's amazing how how the Bible is so functional. How all of the words in the Gospels and the the, the point of the parables is functionality. And uh, I try to every every Sunday I try to summarize the Gospel, but after that, also give one or two ideas that the Gospel is trying to portray. And I I, I try to stay away from giving too much information because it's you know when you ask the people after you give them 10 different topics and 10 different ideas what have you remembered they probably won't remember much but if you give them one or two and the point of that uh, parable they'll go home remembering at least something so uh, that's what I tried to do I, I don't want to bombard bombard them with too much information but you know keep Keep it simple in a sense that, you know, they will remember tomorrow what the priest said in their sermon. Right. And on the topic of uh, spiritual lessons, what spiritual instructions and lives of the saints do you find to be the most helpful to your spiritual growth? And what do you suggest that people read? Well, it's it's uh, it's uh, it's dif- it's different for every person. And and. Uh, the thing is, the spiritual instructions. I don't. Uh, I don't believe that there's something set for every person. What I usually tell my parishioners, and especially at confession, is you know, if we want to be better, we need to fast. And fasting is only a journey that leads us to uh, taking holy Eucharist to communion. Um, and if we do feel the need, if we have something on our heart, on our soul, um, then we should take confession as well. Um, in seminary high school, we were taught to take confession before every uh, communion. Um, 
And in that sense, with a clean heart, clean soul, you're becoming one with Christ. Um, so that's what I usually tell them to, to fasting and uh, prayer and then confession and leading up to, to communion. Um, that would be a spiritual structure that, that, um, that I would recommend. But then again, everyone has and should have, as we mentioned before, their own unique uh, prayer structure, spiritual structure, in a sense, you, you sh every person, every baptized Christian Orthodox should have their relationship with God and their prayers before uh, going to sleep and after uh, wait, when they wake up and before lunch, after lunch. In a sense, everyone should have their relationship with God. And uh, in terms of books, um, uh, Starat Spicy is something I I read all the time. Uh, I also have St. Nikolai uh, and some of his books that I'm going to start uh, taking articles out of and, and uh, sending it to my parishioners. And then we're going to have Lenten, uh, Lenten discussions after Vespers on Saturdays. And God willing, uh, and not just uh, discussions about those articles, but discussions about our faith, about Great Lent, about what actually fasting means and uh, that it's only you know a journey that takes us to the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ so God willing it will be fruitful and profitable for everyone and as you said and for myself as well I'm a young priest I'm always willing to learn always willing to hear different um, different ideas like his grace mentioned that at our liturgy um, in his homily, that through fast, a person has to feel hunger. Because if they do not feel hunger, they, in a sense, well, hunger actually makes you look for God and search for God. Because it's brought you to a place where you're, you're, you're vulnerable. And then you're able to pray to God and have that peace, that inner peace. And uh, the other day I had, it was Wednesday, and I had a funeral in the morning and I forgot to uh, have coffee, but I didn't have breakfast. And then in the evening we had pre-sanctified liturgy. So after 12 uh, in the uh, afternoon, we're not allowed to eat. So I didn't eat anything until the pre-sanctified liturgy. And around six o'clock pre-sanctified liturgy starts and I'm, I see that I'm shaking, but I, I said to myself, glory to God, this is, this is my way of giving something back to Christ. As he sacrificed his life, what are we giving to Christ? And that's what I told, uh, that's what I said to my parishioners in, in, uh, at the end of one service is single out a few details, a few things in your life that you want to get better at or that you want to give up for Christ. And uh, what are we going to sacrifice? Christ sacrificed his life. We need to sacrifice something, and we are all sin, sinful human beings. There's always something we can get better at, and something that we can sacrifice. Right, and you know this. This is a uh, this I think is especially a problem for young people because of how much they're being attacked nowadays. And as as a young person yourself, regardless of your what I would say ideal. Um, but unconventional upbringing, I'm sure you're tempted with a lot of the same things that young people today are tempted with as well. So what is your advice to the youth who want to be better Orthodox Christians in a world that is so saturated with noise and, and temptation and evil from every corner? Well, that is true. And it's hard, as we mentioned before, this modern world is, is first of all, we live fast paced. And right now here in, in Pennsylvania, it's much slower than it is in New York, but uh, where, where I was prior to this. Um, but in a sense, for the youth, especially considering that we spend a lot of time using our phones and our laptops, computers. Um, now, Apostle Paul says that so that means everything is allowed, but not everything benefits you. So in a sense, if you're using your phone all the time and you're on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and whatever else, try to filter 
the feed and try to you know filter the feed in a sense where especially now in great lent you should probably look to not use your phone as much and and use a prayer book instead um but if you are using your phone try to search for those pages that are that have unique um spiritual messages or or uh biblical quotes and and in that sense, and even the stories that we have from the monks and nuns from, from monasteries, and try to get your focus, your mind in that state. And that's how we will, and I tell this to my parishioners as well, is, you know, we need to surround ourselves with that type of information to be in that state of mind. We cannot all day long look at, you know, all this horrible stuff on Instagram and Facebook, and then try to be calm in church on Sunday or, or on Wednesdays at pre-sanctified or at Vespers Saturday. It's hard. So we need to surround ourselves 24-7 with that and uh, information and, and in the sense of that spiritual information. And it will be easier for us to adjust. Right. I, I also think that because of, like you mentioned, the fast-paced nature of our life here in the Western world, as well as all this um all this negative media that we're bombarded with uh i think i think it clouds people's judgment and it removes the virtue of discernment from many people so how should people cultivate discernment within themselves or maybe more specifically how should people learn to know if things are signs from god or lies of the devil um because sometimes it's it's hard to tell for a lot of people well as young people that, uh, especially like in my parish, I'm a young priest here, the parishioners should create relationships with, with their priests. And if it's not their priest, then it's a nun in a monastery or a monk in, in a different monastery. And uh, just communicate, communicate. And, and uh, one thing that I always say is confession is not... A service in which you come and tell me I did this this and this father now can I get uh, I repent and, and uh, can I get absolved it's not that I tell them it's a dialogue between you and the priest you know what is on your heart tell me what's on your heart and let's talk about it let's see how I can help you let's see how I can go with you through this journey and in that way young people can be open towards their spiritual father, because he is only there a witness. They are basically standing in front of an icon of Christ and stating what's on their soul, what's on their mind, on their in their hearts. And in that way, being honest, not hiding anything, because if they do hide something, it will be a, even a greater sin. Um, this way, they will get feedback from their spiritual father and know that most people who are strong in faith have little hardships here and there and I can see their heart on their selves and so we don't need to go into real big details if we're you know talking about stuff that's not that important or that serious um, and it's, that's usually what happens and, and I try to be there for my parishioners in the sense of telling them don't be too hard on yourself we are we our human nature is sinful. We, it's good that we're aware of what's happening around us and, and our sins, our actions. Um, but, you know, God won't reject you because of that. And that's not a good reason for you not to take communion. So it's, it's usually that that story. And especially with younger people, it's, you know, I don't, there's not that much sin that they can, a serious sin that, you know, they would be uh, they would get an epithemia and not be able to, to, to commune. But uh, just that communication and openness, uh, especially even when I look at myself, I'm a young priest. I also need a spiritual father, someone who I can talk to, in a sense, vent to. And when I have uh, problems or issues that, uh, that uh, I myself am not in, in, in the opportunity to 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 uh resolve then you can go to someone who's got more experience more knowledge someone who can guide you spiritually and uh thank god that that's that's 
one way that we should all live our Orthodox Christian life, especially in the United States and Canada, Australia, England, and in you know Western countries that are in that mentality. Absolutely. And I also think that a result of, like you just said, people being too hard on themselves, it, it may create within people a, uh, a a spiritual sense of dormition or a uh, or a depression, per se. So, you know, you, you see a lot of people running around now that are unsatisfied with life or bored or, you know, purposeless. So what do you think? How can people learn? to maybe be grateful for, for the lives they have when they're constantly upset or dissatisfied or bored with life, maybe due to a spiritual illness, maybe due to another reason, but maybe they don't want to be. Well, like I mentioned before, the, the phone is, is the phone or the laptop, the computer, uh, social media is something that when you read a good book, you get good energy. When you read a spiritual book, you get spiritual ideas and, you know, you get motivation for life when you use your phone and you're on instagram all day long or tiktok facebook uh it basically takes your good energy away and all after that all you're good for is turning on the tv or going to sleep so one thing i would suggest and especially in great blend and we just completed the first week is leaving your phone away as much as you can and then that, again, depends on your type of job that you do and, and uh, type of life that you have. But leave it as much as you can and go for walks in the park. Be in the nature. We humans are made from the dirt, from the earth. And we're supposed to be in the nature where we are, especially in nowadays, the weather is very good, which is very... Uh, uncalled for for March but uh you know spend some time in in the nature with friends activities in the park um journeys to the monastery uh, things like that that will give you some spiritual excitement um and it, right after all of that you will see that how much happier you are in life how much more energy you have you will have that spiritual energy, but you will be, let's say, physically exhausted after a hike, and then you're ready to sleep. Um, it's just that uh, nowadays, the phone and, and uh, the social media and everything, they bombard you with all these unneeded information and uh, ideas that over floods your brain in the sense, and you lose, you lose all this good energy for what? So, God willing, it will, uh, all the people who, all the youth who are trying to be part of church, in a sense, part of the life of church, all of us, or mainly most of us are baptized, but a lot of, and especially in our church, in the Serbian church, most of them are not a part of the church life, and they're being dragged away by fast-paced life of, of the Western world, by, you know, by social media, by the phone, and, and uh, you know, using your cell phone all the time. So it's it's a challenge, but God willing, uh, it's on us priests to, to talk to people and talk to the youth and, and create activities for them, uh, opportunities for them to get closer to God spiritually. Right. And I, I also feel like, you know, when people are on are on their phones and they're so influenced by the culture here there's this sense of egotistical supremacy of of this pride that that people develop and you know when they eventually open up the lives of the saints and the teachings of the fathers they they start to see that humility is is one of the primary virtues that we should attain for our salvation so in saying that how can people learn to be humble and forgiving against all the examples around them signaling them to be the opposite that's a very good question it's it's very hard because we as humans we usually act by the example we see and that is one of the greatest things i've realized in seminary high school we all as young uh boys acted the way we were taught in our households so it, that is very hard 
to to see because uh, actually to realize in today's world because all the examples around us and on social media are the complete opposite. Uh, when you look at people are are rejoicing with Rolex watches and uh, different types of Louis Vuitton bags, handbags, and all of that, and it takes time for the youth to realize that that realistically in life is not important. All that stuff comes and goes. I know that a lot of saints said, instead of wearing a Rolex on your hand, wear a Bruyansa or a prayer rope. You know, it's just as valuable as that Rolex, which is 10, 15, $20,000 or even more. Um, but this will get you to the, to the kingdom of heaven. A Rolex it can give you self satisfaction for a period of time, but then that will pass as well. Everything that's materialistic is is uh, passes. It's it's not sustainable. But everything that is has to do with God. And when you put Christ in the middle of everything, that is what is sustainable. And that's how you see parishes who are sustained for a hundred, two hundred, three hundred years. Um, it's because Christ is living. He's there in in the middle of that parish. He's the he's the center stone of that. Uh, congregation so it, it uh it will be uh hard because especially for the youth there's no they don't have examples to look at on social media they will have to go as i said and search for that in church in their friends like for example you are a young person you have a lot of friends um and not all of them are in church not so many anymore i got rid of a lot of them <laughs> yeah but but then again, when you look at it in a sense, uh, some of them will come back to you and say, you know, tell me more about our church, about our faith. You know, in a sense, you have to be a missionary as well. And not just friends, but other people that you meet. You need to you know, talk about God to them, talk about our church, about activities at our church, about just the way of life, the way of our life, our Christian life. And people will catch on because it's a time where um, we're poor spiritually, especially the youth, very poor spiritually. And that is on us priests because they don't have knowledge. And not just like on us priests, as I said, it's on everybody who is a missionary and all Orthodox people and Christians are missionaries. We should constantly talk about Christ to people and uh, teach them about Christ. They don't know much about our faith. So it, that should be a task for all of us to constantly talk about Christ to, to all the people around us. Yeah. I, I think people also have the opposite problem from the messages that come from our culture where some people may have this problem of arrogance and, uh, and supremacy over others. But there's also the problem where people may feel impotent and, and cowardly because maybe they don't feel like they're capable. Maybe they don't feel like they're worth anything. So how can God help inspire bravery and ambition within people? And how can individuals assist themselves in that process as well? Well, in the way of, of like I said, it takes time. Nothing happens overnight. And I tell this to my parishioners, a confession. Us Orthodox priests, we're not magicians. You know, we are Orthodox priests who are witnesses of God. And as one Holy Father says, as a priest, do not ever allow yourself to get in the way of Christ. Always allow Christ to be first and to be portrayed through you to the parishioner and to uh, all the faithful. But in that sense, it takes time. It takes time, as I said, through fasting, through prayer, through confession, through communion. That's where that bravery comes, that, that strength from God. Um, and it's not something that's built overnight it's it's a marathon orthodoxy is a marathon and it will take time but once you do feel that you will never want to go away um once you if you have one sunday that you don't go to church you feel like you missed a part of a part an important part of your life it's a moment in time it's it's remembering the future that's what our what our liturgy actually is so uh it will take time and, and it just through through communion, through feeling, having that with uh, inner feeling after communion, that's what 
we need, especially the youth. Right, I agree. And I I hope that those messages resonate with our listeners. Is there anything, any final thoughts you want to communicate to anybody watching? Well, just uh, especially now during Great Lent, to, to uh, it's a difficult journey, a long journey, um, but it's a journey in which we can use to guide ourselves towards the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We shouldn't pay too much attention to fasting and the whole journey itself. We should pay attention to the main goal, the mission, which is resurrection. So take this time and take, take uh, great Lent and prayer and fasting as a tool to getting ourselves in the state where we are ready to accept Christ's resurrection. And in the span of everybody's life, we, we celebrate resurrection each and every year. And God willing, each and every year, we prepare better and better for our final and eternal resurrection to eternal life. So God willing, with God's grace, throughout our lives, we will prepare and be found in God's kingdom of heaven one day. Amen. God willing, we will make it to the end of the race. Father Ninjagos, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, our next podcast is going to be with Mother Cristafora, the Yerodisa of the Elwood OCA Monastery. And maybe in between here and then, uh, we will continue our readings of Wounded by Love, the life and wisdom of Elder Now St. Porfirios. Until next time, God be with you all. Banagia be with you all. Father, thank, thank you. you so much for coming on. And we will talk to you all later. I'm Kyrie so Christelle so my 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 Kyrie so Christelle